Well, let's read Matthew 13 from verse 10. And the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? And Jesus answered them, To you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been granted. For whoever has, to him more shall be given, and he will have an abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has shall be taken away from him. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because while seeing, they do not see, and while hearing, they do not hear, nor do they understand. In their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is, fulfilled, is being fulfilled, which says, You will keep on hearing, but will not understand. You will keep seeing, but will not perceive. For the heart of the, this people has become dull. With their, eye, with their ears, they scarcely hear, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they would see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return, and I would heal them. But blessed are you, are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. For truly I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Let's pray. Father, we, as we turn to your word this morning, we know that your word is truth, that it is infallible, unchanging, clear, and authoritative. You have given us your word to reveal yourself to us and to make known your will and your ways. Lord, as we come to you, I, play, I pray, please grant us eyes to see, ears to hear, and minds to to understand. Father, that which we do not know, teach us today. That which we do not understand, explain to us today. That which we do not trust or obey, give us the faith to believe and the will to obey in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this last few weeks I've been we've been transferring some old videos home videos from that's on VHS cassettes to 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 a digital format for those who don't know a VHS cassette find someone else to answer to, to explain that to you uh, anyway on one of these cassettes was a recording where I was leading a little Bible study which we started shortly after we were saved, and I was leading on guitar. Now that brought back very much very fond memories. But what I found unsettling is that I can't even remember ever playing guitar. I can't remember ever being able to do that. You see, what happened was after we moved uh, from England, or at the time we moved, I gave my guitar away and never picked it up again. And I have completely lost that skill. I, I can't play guitar anymore. That knowledge, that ability was taken away from me. And perhaps you have similar stories like that. Uh, this often happens with language skills. If you do not practice a language, if you do not use a language, sooner or later you will find that you cannot really speak that language anymore. You are not as proficient as you once were. And that principle is seemingly universal for, because it covers also biology. If you don't use your muscles, they atrophy. And your muscles dwindle and disappear. And where you once had a torso like a chest of drawers, now your chest has sunk into your drawers. <laughs> this principle also applies to the knowledge that we may have. If we don't use and apply our knowledge, we lose it, we forget it. How many of you can remember phone numbers of someone? Well, we have an app for that. We don't have to remember that. We have lots of information at our fingertips. Now, I think we all would agree that, that knowledge is important. Knowledge is really power. 
Uh, the knowledge of history uh, empowers us to, to, to not repeat the mistakes of, of history. The knowledge of certain sciences enable uh, or empowers people to pursue certain careers like med doctors and, 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 and accountants and engineers. Uh, the knowledge of certain skills empowers really those tradies to, uh, in their careers, uh, chippies and brickies and sparkies and what do they call a plumber? What is the abbreviation of a plumber? Is there, is there one? Still a plumber. All right. Sorry, guys. For those who are plumbers, you, you don't get a special nickname. Uh, knowledge of strategy and tactics empowers one to defend yourself and to counterattack in times of war. And there are myriads of examples where knowledge is important. And, of course, knowledge without understanding is actually... Useless. We may know a lot of things, but if we don't understand what we know, it is practically useless to us. And it is nowhere as important as when it comes to spiritual knowledge, the knowledge of the truth, the knowledge of the Bible, theology, which basically means the study of God, the knowledge of God, who He is and what is His will and His ways. Knowledge is important, but understanding is essential of that knowledge. Without understanding, that knowledge will never benefit us, for we will not believe it, and therefore we will not trust it, and it will not impact our lives as it should. There was a man, Dawson Trotman, who, who knew a lot about the Bible. He actually in, in, uh, enlisted into a Bible or scripture memory competition at a church. Why? Because he liked the girl that was there. So he went unsaved, and he won that competition. He, he, he knew most scriptures. He could memorize most scriptures. But he still did not understand what he learned until the Spirit of God used those very scriptures to convert him, and he started the Navigator's um, ministry. But many outside of the church may have heard of God. They may have heard of Christ and the gospel, they may have some knowledge of God, some knowledge of Christ, some knowledge of the gospel, but they lack spiritual understanding. They lack faith. They lack trust in the knowledge that they have on a, on a human level. And even those, what I would say, inside the church, there are those who may have knowledge but lacks understanding or they at least are limited in their understanding and therefore have little faith or weak faith, weak trust. Now, we are in the Gospel of Matthew, and Jesus taught and displayed Himself, none other as Jesus the Savior to His people, Christ the King of the kingdom of heaven, and Emmanuel, God with us, God incarnate. And the religious leaders and the nation of Israel, really, at, uh, during Jesus' generation, had knowledge. They had great knowledge. In fact, they were the nation that had the most knowledge, really, of all other nations in history at that time. Special revelation about God, from God, His person, His will, His ways. And they had Jesus, the greatest revelation of God, from God, about God to them. And they listened to him preach, but they did not hear him. They did not understand him. Even while he was teaching plainly and clearly, as we saw in chapters 1 to 10, and especially in the chapters 5 to 7 in the Sermon on the Mount, they saw his deeds. They saw his wonderful miracles, but did not perceive him to be the Christ, the King. God in the flesh. And because they did not hear, and because they did not see, they did not understand. And therefore they did not believe, and they did not receive Jesus as King. You see, to truly see, you need spiritual understanding. To truly hear, you need the Spirit's enabling. You need spiritual illumination by the Spirit of God. Now just keep, keep your finger in Matthew 13 and just, just turn over to 1 Corinthians 2 quickly. 1 Corinthians 
to Paul was writing to the Corinthian church and he was really defending his, his preaching of Christ and him crucified despite the proud Corinthians' view that preaching of the gospel is foolishness to Greeks and a stumbling block to Jews. Paul's argument is that that is the very power and wisdom of God unto salvation. And so in verse 6 we read, Yet we do not speak wisdom among those who... Yet we do speak wisdom among those who are mature, a wisdom, however, not of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are passing away. So this is a wisdom that is derived not by human wisdom or imagination, not by the rulers of that age. Verse 7 says, But we speak God's wisdom in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory, the wisdom which none of the rulers of the age has understood for it, that if they had understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. <clears throat> so we are, here we have a, a really a definition of, a, of what the mystery is. A mystery is here in this context is God's wisdom, His word, which was hidden in ages past, but has now been revealed, made known through the preaching of Paul, the preaching of the gospel. This wisdom was not understood by the rulers of, of men at that time, for otherwise they would not have crucified Christ. Verse 9 says, But just as it is written, things which eye has not seen or ear has not heard, and which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love Him. Many, uh, I, I've heard, many read this verse, verse 9, and then they, they think it refers to the wonders of, of heaven, which God has prepared for those who would love Him, when in fact it's referring to Christ. Christ is the one. Christ is the, is the wonder that He would reveal to us. Uh, what eye has not seen, ears not heard, before no mind conceived, is this wonderful, marvelous reality of Christ, the gospel of Christ, the good news. No human mind could ever conceive it, nor ever fathom it. The depth of the love, the storehouses of grace that God has prepared for those who love Him. Verse 10, 10 uh, for to us God revealed them through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the Spirit of a man which is in him? Even so the thoughts of God no one knows except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God, which things we also speak not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. But he who is spiritually, he who is spiritually appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he will instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. And so here we see that unless the Spirit of God reveals the Word to us, unless, he, unless we receive it from the Spirit of God, unless we are taught by the Spirit of God, unless He illuminates the person to the truth of God, we cannot and will not accept Christ. We cannot and will not accept the gospel. Man in his natural state cannot accept, cannot receive, cannot believe the things of the Spirit of God because they need to be spiritually revealed, spiritually illuminated. Now, go back to Matthew 13. We've seen last week that Jesus was teaching in parables. And Matthew 13 is a chapter of parables, a teaching method which Jesus used predominantly since the nation and the religious leaders rejected Him as King and His offer of the kingdom to them. And last week we studied the parable of the sower and we saw that the focus is not on the sower, nor on the seed, but on the soil. That it is the same seed that was sown in different kinds of soil. And Jesus explained that the soil was the heart of man. And so different hearts respond differently to the Word of God. And there was the hardened heart, hearts that were impenetrable to the Word of God. There were the selfish hearts, those who were eagerly and quickly <clears throat> 
joyfully receive the Word of God for the blessings that it offers, but it withers and wilts when the cost started to cut into them, the hardship and opposition that belonging to the kingdom of heaven invites. We saw the divided and the deceived heart, the dirty heart, the infested heart, the ones who, in whom the cares and the, and the, and the love of, of this world really suffocated the Word of God out of their life, rendering them fruitless. And we saw the genuine heart, the true heart, the fruitful heart, in which the seed of God was planted and it produced a crop 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100-fold. That is the heart who hears, that is the heart who sees, that is the heart who understands and responds in faith. And since Jesus was rejected the religious leaders of Israel, by the religious leaders of Israel, Jesus began to teach them in parables. And his disciples noted it. They noticed it and, and they asked, well, why do you speak to them in parables? And the answer to that is really what will occupy our minds and enlarge our souls this morning as we looked at his answer. And Jesus' answer can be summarized really in two short phrases, to reveal and to conceal. That's why he taught in parables, to reveal spiritual truth to those who believed and who use it, and to conceal spiritual truth to those who refuse to believe what they have received and resist responding to it. And so there's, uh, actually we have a third point here this morning. It's also to point out, but it's more of an application to what was said before, taken from verse 16 and, and 17. But why did Jesus teach in parables? Well, it is to, to reveal. To reveal the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Now, the mystery is not an unsolved riddle or a conundrum as we understand it today, but it's simply a revelation of knowledge from God which was not previously known and which cannot be conceived or concocted or discovered through natural man's wisdom or ingenuity. A.W. Pink says, according to the usage of the word in the New Testament, a mystery is a concealed truth over which a veil is cast. It concerns something which transcends the powers of man to conceive and therefore beyond his ability to invent. It relates to something which is undiscoverable by, human, by the human mind beyond human knowledge until divinely revealed. Charles Hodge, a 19th century uh, reformed uh, pastor, theologian, and, and, and principal of the Prince, uh, Prince, uh, Princeton Theological Seminary said, any future event which could not be known only by divine revelation is a mis mystery. And then H. A. Ironside was also a pastor in the 20th, early part of the 20th century uh, who, who led the Moody uh, Memorial Church in Chicago. He said, that the mysteries of the New Testament are things which we should know, yet strangely are largely ignored by the masses of today's Christians. And as we look at the landscape of, of Christianity, the church, we see how many ignore and dismiss the clearly revealed mystery of the kingdom of, of heaven, the death of Christ, his bodily resurrection, his bodily return, his physical reign on the throne of David in Jerusalem, the salvation of all of Israel at a future time, at that time of his return, and all of the revealed truths and marvel of his mediatorial kingdom that he will restore. And if I look at that, I think I agree with Ironside that much of what has been revealed to us are ignored by the masses of today's Christians. And in the New Testament, there are, of course, several uh, ideas or truths that is described as the mysteries of, of God in the New Testament. We have the mystery of God's wisdom. We have the mystery of Christ himself. 
the fullness of deity in, 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 in uh, bodily form, the mystery of the gospel. We have the mystery of really our instant glorification when we are transformed to our glorified bodies at the rapture of the church. We have the mystery of the union of Christ with His bride, the church. We have the mystery of Christ in us, the hope of glory. The mystery of godliness, the mystery of God's plans and purposes for the dispensation of the fullness of time, basically the, our eschatology. The mystery of Israel's present blindness and partial hardening and their future salvation. The mystery of lawlessness, the mystery of the seven stars, and the mystery of Babylon. All of those things are, are mysteries that were previously hidden but has now been revealed to us in the New Testament. But Jesus said he taught in parables because the knowledge and understanding of these mysteries, the mysteries of the kingdom, which was previously hidden, are now being revealed, granted to you. Now the you refers to his disciples, to those who believed in him, who followed him at that time. To them it has been granted. They have received this revelation, not because they were smarter than the scribes and the, and the Pharisees or any other person in any other time, but because it was graciously bestowed upon them. It was granted to them. It was an act of God's sovereign grace, granted to His elect. The elect are those who we recognize as who believe in Jesus, and are saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. And so verse 11 speaks of God's sovereign and gracious purposes towards His elect. They are given knowledge and understanding of the mysteries of the kingdom. This does not mean that they knew everything, that they understood everything, no, it imp simply implies that they were given their spiritual capacity to know and understand the revelation of God, of God about the kingdom. We as believers have knowledge and understanding of God, of Christ. But we do not have perfect knowledge or complete knowledge. We still have to grow in that as we study the Scriptures, as we seek to walk by the Scriptures, obey the Scriptures, as the Spirit of God who has been given us, illuminate our minds to the truth of Scriptures. As these things, are, these spiritual things are taught to us in spiritual words, as we read in 1 Corinthians 2.13. And to them, it was not granted. Who are the them? Well, it's those who did not believe in Jesus, who did not receive Him, who did not trust in Him, but rejected Him. They too had received knowledge, they sat under Jesus' teaching, but they rejected Him. They saw His miracles, but they rejected Him. And now, Jesus said, I am hiding new truth from them. And verse 11, as I said, really points out God's sovereign gracious purposes towards those who are His and verse 12 and following, really the focus shifts to man's responsibility with what we do with what we've been given. Verse 12 says, For whoever has, to him more shall be given, and he will have an abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has shall be taken away from him. Jesus said, that those with, who received spiritual truth, spiritual knowledge, and use that knowledge, respond to that knowledge, believe that knowledge, and act upon that knowledge. The truth that they have received will grow. It will increase. The spiritual knowledge that they will have will be added to, will expand. On the other hand, 
for those who do not use the spiritual truth, the spiritual knowledge given to them, they will find that it will vanish, that it will diminish. Little by little, it will dwindle away until it is as if they had never received it. The knowledge given to them will be taken away from them. And really, this is both an encouragement and a warning to all people. Encouragement that if we use the knowledge, the spiritual insight granted us by God, we will grow. We will grow into greater knowledge and greater understanding. More will be given to us. God will bless our faithfulness, our stewardship of what He has given us. The knowledge of the gospel, the knowledge of Christ, the knowledge of the word. However, if we do not, even the little that was given us will be dwindling away, will disperse little by little until it's gone, until we can't even remember having it. There are many exhortations in this New Testament that urges us, we who profess Christ, who has received Christ, to use what we have been given, to grow in that. Maybe flip over to 2 Peter 1. 2 Peter 1, verse 5. Second Peter 1, verse 5 reads, for, Now for this very reason also, what is, what is the reason? Well, verse 4, the fact that you've been granted Christ's precious and magnificent promises and were made partakers of His divine nature. Because of that reason, apply all diligence and in your faith supply moral excellence. In your moral excellence, knowledge. In your knowledge, self-control. In your self-control, perseverance. In your perseverance, godliness. And in your godliness, brotherly kindness. In your brotherly kindness, love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these qualities is blind and short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Therefore, brethren, all the more, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, the entrance to the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be abundantly supplied to you. Faith in Christ must impact our lives, our morals. It must stir up a, a desire, a hunger for more knowledge. To live by it. To be changed by it. To be transformed by it. That is the nature of faith. Flip over to Hebrews 5. Hebrews 5 is... Verse 5, another example, exhortation for us to grow in what we have received, and if we don't, there's risk of us losing it. Hebrews 5, verse 5, the author is here teaching on the marvelous spiritual truth about Christ and his high priestly role in the order of Melchizedek. And he wanted to reveal more spiritual truth about Melchizedek, but said he couldn't. Why? Because they had become dull of hearing. They heard, but did not use what they heard. And what they heard was slipping away from them. Verse, verse 5, uh, chapter 5, verse 11 reads, Now concerning him, that is Melchizedek, we have much to say. And it is hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again of someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. 
For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. Solid food are for those who have used milk to grow, to train their senses to discern between right and wrong, good and evil. And failure to do so result in you not growing and able to handle meat, more truth, deeper truth. And so God grants spiritual knowledge and spiritual understanding to His elect. Are you one of His elect? Are you one of His? How do you know? How can you know? Well, one way is to look at how you respond to the Word of God. Do you receive it? As the word of God. Do you believe it as the word of God? Do you do what the word of God commands you to do? Do you listen to him? Do you obey him? Because if not, scripture urges you to stop making excuses. Stop rationalizing your procrastination. Repent of your divided and deceived heart. De repent of your selfish heart. Repent of your hardened heart and receive the seed of God's word and let it grow. Let it be fruitful in your life. And you will increase, your crop will increase from 30 to 60 fold, from 60 fold to 100 fold. Believe Christ is the king. Believe Christ. Receive Christ as the King and live with Christ as your King. Which means submit to Him and obey Him because you love Him for what He has done for you. And so the reason Jesus taught in parables was to reveal the truth of the kingdom of heaven. It is to reveal His will and His ways, to make them known and to make them grow in fertile hearts, genuine hearts, consecrated hearts. So He taught parables to reveal truth, but also to conceal truth. Verse 13 to 15 Therefore I speak to them in parables, because while seeing they do not see, and while hearing they do not hear, and nor do they understand. In their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled, which says, You keep on hearing, but will not understand. You will keep on seeing, but will not receive. For the heart of this people has become dull. With their ears they scarcely hear, and, with, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they would see with their eyes and hear with their ears, understand with their heart and return, and I would heal them. And so here there's this preposition, therefore, alerts us to what Jesus said before, which is the reason why he taught in parables. And it's the reason is because of this divine principle of accountability. Man is responsible with what he does with what he been given to him the knowledge of God have they received it have they believed it have they lived by it or not he explained further that the generation of his day received and they received a lot they received the Old Testament scriptures the law and the prophets and they have received the clear and plain teaching of Jesus Christ, showing them He is Christ the King. But they did not believe. They did not respond to the knowledge given to them. And so while seeing, they did not see. And while hearing, they did not hear, nor did they understand. And because of that, Jesus said, I am now concealing any more knowledge 
about the king and the kingdom from them. That's why I'm teaching in parables. Switching to teach in parables was really an, an act of judgment. By taking away the word of God, his life giving word to those who would not believe. See, they saw but chose not to see. They heard but chose not to hear. Their minds, their hearts were closed to the word of God. They would not believe, so now they could not believe. No more knowledge, no more revelation, and even what they had will be taken away from them. Every man, every woman is responsible and accountable for the knowledge they have received from God. The people have hardened their hearts against the message of the king. They saw his wonderful deeds, but acted as if they did not. They heard his clear teaching, but responded as if they've never heard it. Therefore, they did not repent of their sin, and they did not believe that the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and that the king of the kingdom is standing right before them. They did not receive Jesus Christ. Their hardened hearts were already made up, resistant, hardened to the Word of God, and so the Word of God was taken away from them. It was snatched from them, as the parable said. Those with selfish hearts only sought the benefits of the kingdom, but were unwilling to endure the hardship and opposition that belonging to the kingdom bring, and so their confession, their commitment withered and wilted to nothing. The Word of God died in their hearts. The divided and deceived hearts appear to have received Christ, but their care and love for worldly things overwhelmed and choked the Word of God out of their lives. And the Word of God was suffocated in them. It was supplanted by worldliness. And the word of God was lost to them. Because they did not respond to what they received, God now conceals his new revelation about the kingdom from them by teaching in parables. And Jesus said, they are just like the generation of Isaiah. The words of Isaiah are actually being fulfilled in them. Now Isaiah was, was sent to Israel, also with a message of repentance and faith. Repent from your wicked ways and believe and trust in God. And as God was sending Isaiah, he warned him that the people will hear, but will not understand. The people will see, but they will not perceive. Why? Because their hearts... In the Hebrew thinking, that refers to the whole person. But here the emphasis is on the mind, on their thinking. Their minds have become dull, insensitive, unresponsive, unwilling to receive the Word of God. Also their ears, they have become deaf. They, they, they can scarce, scarcely hear. And their eyes, they can't see. Why? For they closed them. People, that is a deliberate act. If you lose your hearing, it, it's passive. It happens to you. But to close your eyes is deliberately closing your eyes to the truth of God. And that was what the generation on Isaiah did. And that was the generation of Jesus. They willfully closed their eyes. They would not believe. And so now they could not believe. They chose not to see. And, and the wonder of God, it says that if they opened their eyes and if they uh, opened their ears, they would have understood. 
they would have repented. And what would the Lord do? He would restore them. He would heal them. That is what he does. Because he is a gracious, forgiving God. But they refused. They refused Isaiah's message. And God judged them. He exiled them to Babylon, taking away what they once had. Their land, the Jerusalem, the temple, and its worship practices. But God graciously restored them to their land, to the city of Jerusalem, reinstated temple worship 70 years later, not because of them, but because of who God is. Gracious and faithful to his promises that he made to their ancestors. Then a few centuries later, God sent Jesus, the word incarnate, the greatest and clearest revelation of God, with the clearest and most gracious offer of the kingdom, calling them to repent of their sins, repent of their self-righteousness, and believe he is their long-awaited, God-anointed king. But like the generation in Isaiah's day, they did not repent at the preaching of Jesus. They did not believe Jesus is Christ, despite all they saw and all they heard. And so judgment would fall again. God taking away the word of God from them, concealing it, hiding it. First in the form of parables. As I said, parables was a, was a sign of judgment on their unbelief. Later on, there was another form of judgment that fell upon unbelievers. The concealing of God's word to those who would not receive and would not believe the plain teaching of God's word. And that was really the speaking in tongues. Speaking in unknown or unfamiliar languages. See, the gift of tongues was a sign of judgment to those who would not believe. Paul quoted Isaiah 28, 11 in his letter to the Corinthians, where he addresses the abuse of the gift of tongues, of languages. 1 Corinthians 14, 21 reads, In the Lord is written, and then he quotes Isaiah 28, 11, By men of strange tongues and by lips of strangers I will speak to this people, and even so they will not listen to me, says the Lord. So then, tongues are a sign not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. But prophecy is a sign not to unbelievers, but to those who believe. The gift of tongues or languages served as a sign, a warning of God's coming judgment to Israel for not believing. Israel was judged and exiled to Babylon at the teaching of Isaiah. Really, they were saying the same things to Isaiah. They're saying the word of God is like babble, it's like baby talk. We don't understand it. We don't understand it. It's incomprehensible. Sav la sav, kav la kav, order on order, line upon line. And they did not heed the word of God, and so God judged them. And then at Pentecost, at the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, they heard people proclaim the glories of God in all different languages. And many did not, still did not believe, because the word of God was hidden from them. And then in 70 AD, Titus Vespasius, the Roman emperor, came and he absolutely demolished Jerusalem and the temple and dispersed the people to the four corners of the world. And unbelieving Israel is to this day under the curse of breaking God's covenant, breaking His word, rejecting their king. And their house is now left to them desolate, Jesus said in Matthew 23, 38. 
their, work to, their worship practices terminated. Their covenant superseded by the new covenant. Their hearts hardened towards the gospel. A partial hardening has taken place. And they will not believe the gospel, they will not believe Christ until the day when they look upon Him whom they have pierced and mourn for Him as one mourned for an only son, as the prophet Zechariah said. What they had was taken away from them. And so much so, much so that today the majority of Jewish people is secular, non-religious. And even those who hold to some kind of religious orthodoxy, they only practice a fraction of what the law commands them to do. Most Jews today have given up understanding the Old Testament Scriptures. And all they have left is their tradition. What they had was taken away from them. And it's only by God's supernatural intervention because of His grace and because of His faithfulness to His own word that God will restore them in the future. But until then, they are under God's judgment through this judicial hardening of their hearts. And so Jesus taught in parables to reveal new spiritual truth to those who believe and to conceal spiritual truth to those who refuse, resist, and reject the Word of God. And then he used this occasion really to point out to the disciples the blessing of their illumination, the blessing of what they have received. Verse 16, But blessed are your eyes because they see, and your ears because they hear. For truly I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desire to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. The disciples were given an immense privilege, a privilege that was denied to centuries of prophets and righteous men. Prophets were those who took the word of God and proclaim it. Righteous men were those who took the Word of God and lived by it. They responded to the Word of God and they did not receive what the disciples received. But because they believed, the disciples would receive more. Not because of their own merit, but solely because of God's gracious purposes. They will see more, they will hear more, more than any of the Old Testament prophets and righteous men. 1 Peter 1.10 reads, As to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. And it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you in these things which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. The disciples saw clearly what the saints of old only saw dimly. The disciples heard loudly what the faithful saints of old only heard faintly. The disciples lived with Christ. They witnessed His life, His death, His resurrection, His ascension. After His resurrection, Jesus opened their eyes. He unlocked scriptures to them. On the road of Emmaus, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, He explained to them the things concerning Himself in all the scriptures. More was given to them. And he poured on them the Holy Spirit to reveal and illuminate the gospel so that to proclaim it and explain it. And that's where we get the New Testament from. 
And he's given his Holy Spirit to all his people so that he would verify the truth that we hear. 1 John 2, 27, As for you, the anointing which you have received from him abides in you, referring to the Holy Spirit. And you have no need for anyone to teach you, but as his anointing teaches you about all things, and is true and is not a lie, just as, you has, just as it has taught you, you abide in him. They have been given more because they responded to what they had. And people, that brings us to us today. We have received far more than any generation before us. All that the disciples received, all that the apostles received, we have given to us in the Word of God. And not only that, we have centuries of doctrinal refinement as the Holy Spirit worked on the hearts of men to define for us and clearly, clearly articulate to us the doctrines which Scripture teaches us about God, the Trinity, the triune God, Christ, His humanity and divinity, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, the doctrine of salvation, that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, the doctrine of the kingdom of God, the church and the end times. We have been given so much. We live in a part of the world where we can freely hear the word of God, where the word of God is still treated as the word of God and preached and taught and applied. We have great sermons from great men at the touch of a button. We have been given much people. May we not be merely hearers of his word, but doers. For it is those who are doers of the word that are truly blessed. And if we ignore the word of God given to us, we may find that we may lose some of that. You will say, well, France, aren't we the elect? It's, it's not really possible. I said, yes, that's true. If you are the elect of God, if you are saved by grace through faith in Christ, you are His. And you may choose not to act on the words that He's given you, but you will stand before Him one day and you will look at your life and your work and it would be wood, hay and stubble that will burn up in a flash. What will you say to your Savior when He asks you, what have you done with the grace I've given you in the Word that I've revealed to you? Why teach in parables? To reveal more spiritual truth to those who believe and use it. And to conceal spiritual truth and take it away from those who was given it, but refused it, resisted it, rejected it. We have received much. May we believe it, live by it, or risk losing it. Let me pray for us. Father, Thank you, Lord, that you speak to us, that you are not silent. Thank you, Lord, for your word, for your encouragement that if we are faithful with what you have given us, you will give us more. And we will delight ourselves in the wonders of Christ, the glories of his marvelous being, his magnificent promises. Lord, partaking in His divine nature. Share in that, Lord. Be conformed to it, Lord. Oh, how wonderful the promise that is. And Lord, we also are warned not to neglect what You have given us. Lest we find that once, what we once knew is somehow distant somehow less 
unsure and uncertain. And so, Father, by your Spirit, work in our hearts today. Help us to make a resolution this morning that we will be faithful and that we will be good stewards of the mysteries of God entrusted to us. In Jesus' name, amen.